Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Might might refer to leadership. Absolutely. Leadership. And what other ideas do we have? If, you, if you'd like to talk, you can unmute your um, microphone. Sure. Management skills and behavior, yes. Yes, yes. Connection to others, ethics, the way that people connect or, or deal with people. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The culture, yes. Oh, you guys have been picking up great nuggets. Emotional intelligence interesting perhaps let's let's move forward let's you guys have got you you're on to something but we're gonna we're gonna make it real clear for you so what is executive presence in its simplest terms executive presence is about your ability to inspire others and to inspire confidence and you're inspiring confidence in your subordinates um that you're the leader that they want to follow right so you are inspiring confidence among your peers that you're capable and reliable. And most importantly, um, you're inspiring confidence along, among senior leaders that you have the potential for great achievements. So when we talk about uh, executive presence, it is about you inspiring confidence in all of those around you, right? Because you're showing up in a particular way that makes them feel comfortable and makes them know that they can depend on you, right? So, uh oh, sorry, oh, I'll get it. All right, so why do we need executive presence? Like, why is this even a thing or a conversation? Well, your executive presence determines whether you gain access to opportunity. There's a saying in leadership that all the important decisions about you will be made when you're not in the room. It's, and, and it's true because whether it's a decision about an important opportunity, a promotion to a critical role or an assignment of, of uh, or to a high visibility project, you won't be in the room when those conversations are happening, right? The opportunities you gain access to depend on the confidence that you've inspired in the decision makers. And the more significant the opportunity, the more important executive presence becomes, right? So how many of you have had an opportunity where somebody just came to you and said, you know what, we would like you to participate in this project, or we think you would be great for this team, or we think that you, you can um, drop it in the chat or unmute, you know, um, and it just seemed like it came out of nowhere, right? These opportunities just came about. Anybody ever experienced that? I did just this week, right? I, I did just this week that happened. I have, yes. Okay, fantastic. And those things ha happen, right? And you didn't know anything about it. It happened because those discussions were happening behind your back right? You may have even been a part of discussions where there was, where you said, or someone said, we need a person to be able to do X, Y, or Z. And immediately you thought of somebody and you threw their hat in the ring, right? To say, this person always shows up, or this person um, is fabulous with this set of skills or whatever it is. And that's because that person has earned your confidence, right? They, they have earned your respect and, and they have done so with the way they've shown up, the way they've executed their work. Um, and that that's they become your choice because you have the confidence that they will um, be able to get the job done. So here, let's talk a little bit about seven ways that you can build executive presence for yourself right? Because as with any other skill, there are people who naturally are more gifted at executive presence than others. And those people that are gifted in that way may not always be the ones with the titles, right? There may be people that exist on the front line that others listen to because they inspire confidence, 
because the things that they do and how they do it are admired and believed in, right? And so perhaps more importantly, the more senior you become, the more executive presence that is required because the more, um, the higher up the level you go, the more folks you have looking at you, the more folks you have depending on you. So being able to inspire confidence in that way is going to become more important than ever. So here are a couple of ways and steps that you can build on your executive presence. Number one is have a vision and articulate it well. And for any of you that have been at the previous, either the culture and leadership or what's the other one we did, Dahlia? We did culture and leadership. And what was that second week? Lord, you tapping into... That's okay. If you've been here, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? right? We've done a lot. <laughs> yes, we have. Where we've talked about really the, the vision, your why. It was understanding your why. The why. Your why. Yes, we go. your why. That was the other one. So, you know, um, being able to really have the vision and be able to articulate your why and be able to get folks on board and inspire that confidence. Um, and really be able to speak well about it. And we talked and mentioned before about the elevator speech, right? You have to be able to articulate your vision in, to, in the time it would take for you to ride up a level or two in an elevator, right? So you, it has to be clear, it has to be concise, and you have to be able to articulate that right away, okay? The second thing is understand how others experience you. Right, so people with excellent executive presence, they have a keen understanding of how they are perceived by others. And that's pretty important because I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the saying that um, reality is one thing, but perception is everything. It doesn't matter if you are just a really wonderful, genuine person, if you are perceived to be something other than that. Because the way people perceive you perceive you becomes the reality of who you are to them, right? So it's important. things um, in the most direct manner. So it's very important to really kind of understand that, to understand how you come across and how people um, see you. Because this is especially um, important because as you ascend to more senior levels and your span of control expands, you become increasing, increasingly um, reliant on others uh, for your effectiveness. You have to delegate. You have to count on others to do their part. And you know, the more that they have confidence in you, the more that they're willing to follow you, uh, the more you're able to depend on them. So is this all making sense? Can I get a yes or a no in the chat? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. All right, fantastic. All right. Thirdly, you have to build your communication skills. Good leadership is ultimately about communication, right? And being able to be clear with people and be, being able to, to communicate with people in the ways that they best receive that, those messages, right? And when we, when we talk next week, we're gonna talk about generations in the workplace, right? And so we're gonna talk about how you manage all of these generations in one workspace. And we know that we, the different generations definitely communicate in a different way, right? And as a leader, you want to be able to communicate with folks in a way that maybe doesn't always seem comfortable to you. I personally, I come from an era of you got up and you went around and found someone and you had a conversation, right? Now, you know, there's the email generation and then there's the text generation. They want to, you to just give them a few characters. That's, that's all they want is 
a few characters. So being able to communicate in all those ways um, definitely is a way to build your your um, your uh, executive presence. I'm sorry. All right, number four is to also then become an excellent listener. So the one, one of the most important things about communication skills is your ability to listen. All too often, we are listening to respond. We hear just enough of what the person is saying to be able to craft our next thing. And we are chomping at the bit. And we miss everything else that they've said. That, and those things could provide more clarity in what their message is. We need to first, and, and this is as Stephen Covey, right? Um, one of the seven habits. You have to first seek to understand and then to be understood. You have to listen so that you can understand and then be able to dialogue with someone rather than just listening to get your point across or listening to combat whatever it is that they're saying. You wanna understand what they're saying. And even if you don't agree with it, you wanna be able to really understand their perspective. Okay. The fifth thing is to cultivate your network and build political savvy, you know, and that's, that can be really touchy, but people with executive presence recognize that organizational politics um, are neither a good nor bad thing, but they understand that, that in companies that are comprised of complex relationships, um, that there will sometimes be a diversity of opinions and competing agendas, right? And so organizational politics um, is something that simply you have to be able to navigate and you have to know that it's there. You have to understand the rules of engagement in the places in which you, number one, work and in your own businesses, right? You have to know that there is a political piece to that. And those with that executive leadership and who exude that are the ones that can get everyone on board. Okay, making sense? Any questions, any comments before we do these last two? If you wanna say something, you can feel free to unmute or drop, it, drop your question in the chat. No, everybody good? All right. So the sixth way, that you can um, build your executive presence is to learn to operate effectively under stress. You know, you have to think about yourself. How do you, you behave and how do you react when the stakes are high, right? Do you ever appear to be rushed or, or flustered or overwhelmed? Do you kind of lose your patience? Do you have a reputation for being temperamental? Like we just never know who's gonna show up, what version of you is gonna show up. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of believing that looking frantically busy indicates that their value, indicates their value in the organization. Just because you look busy doesn't make you look effective, right? And it doesn't make it look as though you are um, really getting things done. It just makes it look like you're hairy, carry and running all over the place, you know, instead of being still and being decisive and really being able to provide some guidance to those around you, okay? And then lastly, make sure that your appearance isn't a distraction. Now, I wanna take a few minutes before I talk about that and let's talk about some ways a person's appearance can be a distraction. I wanna hear from you guys. What, what in a person's appearance appears as a distraction to you? You can go ahead and unmute or drop a response in the chat. I would say- Yeah. How- uh, I've had times when I worked in the office where I was working with someone and the way they were dressed, they kind of looked more like they was going to the club <laughs> versus, you know, going to a business meeting. Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot. I hear that one in particularly a lot. Thank you, Rod. Anybody else want to share? Don't be shy. 
Okay, let me give you this food for thought, right? There was a time in business that, and and especially in healthcare and industry such as that, where you were told that you couldn't have long fingernails, you couldn't have tattoos that showed, you couldn't have jewelry that was too large. And now, now today, everywhere you go, you can see full sleeves of tattoos, you can see the larger discs in ears, you can see nose rings, earring, fingernails that are this long while somebody's ringing you out. Is that something that is a norm? Does somebody who looks that way throw you off when you are going in somewhere to conduct business? Or have you gotten used to it? Is it the norm? Is it okay? Tell me what you think. Now, it, it kind of doesn't really bother me um, mm -hmm. because I think people need to just be people. Mm -hmm. As long as you are capable of doing the job now, I, I do still have that thing where if you come to work looking like you've been up under your bed up for the last two weeks, <gasps> dust bunnies in your head and mm -hmm. all of that, we're going to have an issue. That's but, That's certainly a different thing, isn't it, Rod? Yeah. But I mean, as far as how a person expresses themselves, if you want multicolored hair, half shaven head, and especially for what I do, because I see a lot of that anyway, mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't really throw me off. Yes, very good, very good. And um, Andrea says, depends on your field of work. And you are absolutely right, Andrea. It does appear, uh, you know, depend on your field of work. But visual appearance makes a first impression. And first impressions, whether they are conscious or subconscious, are powerful, right? You want to ensure that your first impression inspires confidence in others. You know, um, I'm going to tell you a, an experience that I had one time that um, was a little off-putting to me, but I understood where the guy was coming from, right? So I had a relative that passed and um, there were some legal things that we needed to do uh in order to kind of settle her estate and whatnot and so my sister and i were um kind of left in charge of taking care of that and i spoke to the attorney several several times over the phone and we were to meet on a saturday morning and i went and worked out before i went to this meeting and so when my sister got there she had on a nice you know coat a nice winter coat and her hair was kind of all and curls. I came in in sweat clothes. And so he uh, automatically assumed that my sister was the person that he talked to on the phone. And then when we began to talk and he realized that I was the person that, that was actually on, on the phone talking to him, he said that um, I needed to work at making sure that I looked like how I sounded. And I was really offended by that because, I mean, it's Saturday morning, sir. You don't work for me. I don't work for you. We're trying to handle some business. And I found it to be very off-putting. However, what it also made me realize is that that is the reality that we live in right now, right? Um, and so you definitely want to be cognizant of how you show up. Because again, the reality is one thing. Does what I have on make me sound any less intelligent? Does it make me any less intelligent at all? Does it affect my ability to do my job? No, none of those things. However, if we are talking about building executive presence in our own organizations or in our, in our small businesses, it, it matters and we have to be cognizant of that and know that it does matter, right? Um, and so we have to also be willing to accept that feedback because I, that feedback from that man that I never met before was unsolicited, but it stuck with me, right? It stuck with me over time. So, you know, your, your appearance counts, that first impression counts. You want to ensure that your first impression, again, like I said, inspires that confidence. And that doesn't mean that you're trying to look like a fashion model, but rather you're trying to make sure that your appearance is appropriate for the setting and the company culture. 
right? And, and that has to be consistent because if the company, if the company culture is we wear jeans and polos and dockers, you know, and dock shoes, then if you show up in a business suit, you could look extremely elegant, but you look out of place for where you are, right? So you, you want to, and people just feel like you maybe didn't get the memo. So you just want to be cognizant of those things. Okay. So, so that was it for, for that, those seven steps, you know, and if you can certainly think of any additional steps or, or words of wisdom that you've come across, please drop them in the chat for everyone. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about professional image. You know, can you recall someone in the workplace who made a positive impression on you? You know, um, if so, you could just kind of drop a yes, you know, and, and the other question is what did they do and how did it impact you? Go ahead and drop your, your, your answers in the chat, or you can feel free to unmute. If there was someone one in the workplace did to do that and how did it impact you anyone anyone rod are you going to be a speaker for the group i saw you unmuting thank you my friend <laughs> um, one of one of the things that impressed me it wasn't really we wasn't working on a job but we were in a setting uh kind of a mentoring thing and, and this guy he he wore jeans Mm -hmm. tennis shoes, shirt with a tie, and he had a nice blazer on. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what impressed me about him the most is that he was a nice, polite, kind guy, and he blended in very well mm -hmm. with the group, with the people in it that he was working with him. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until they, they announced him that I realized this guy that year alone made $300 million profit. He didn't have, he wasn't draped in jewelry. He had on a watch, a wedding ring. He smiled, he greeted people and he didn't walk around in Armani suits. Right. That impressed me. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Rod. Anybody else have a story? Anita, do you have one? Dahlia, you have one? Recalling someone in the workplace who made a positive impression? What did they do and how did it impact you? Um, I would say it, what always impressed me in the workplace were, was somebody who walked in the room with confidence, um, who was comfortable with uh, the people around them and who didn't stand out in the way they dressed or anything, you know, that the, the, they became part of the group started a dialogue, made other people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, to me, what's important with leadership is to make other people feel comfortable enough to participate and to be like one of them, mm -hmm. uh, but show confidence and leadership. Okay, very good. Thank you, Anita. Dahlia, I saw you had unmuted also. Um, yes, the I would say the one situation that I'm thinking of is a, a former boss who was not afraid of his, I'm not going to call them weaknesses, but, but areas in his expert areas in his world that he may not have been the expert. Mm -hmm. So he didn't mind sharing that in that situation, I was the recruiter. You know, so he didn't mind sharing that he knew absolutely nothing about recruitment, you know, so he relied on my expertise, but then he also was still able to educate me on how to be an expert in the role, mm -hmm. you know, so it was like he was able to teach me what he knew mm -hmm. and to apply it to what I was doing. So it was like he was a leader, but he was extremely humble. Um, in his leadership style. So he was probably, I would say, the greatest um, example that I have of someone that really impressed me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you all for sharing. Did anybody else wanna share or shall we move on? 
Well, perfect. So just keep those things in mind as we go through this. Now, let's recall someone in the workplace who made a negative impression on us, right? What did they do and how did it impact you? That's for the group. That's for the group. Drop it in the chat. Unmute yourself. Is there anyone that, and you don't have to name names, you can change the names to protect the innocent if you like, but have you ever in, in, you know, been in the workplace and there was someone who made a negative impression on you? What was it that they did and how did it impact you? I'm having a hard time believing that no one here has no. ever had that. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I had a boss who, Came to work late. He was that temperamental person uh, you talked about that you don't know what you get in a day. You know, some days, and it made it really made me and other people just kind of shy away from him because one minute he wanted to seem like he's your friend and how you doing and I'm helpful. And then the next minute he's blowing something way out of proportion. You know, um, he, he came into a meeting where the, the uh, secretary thought he grabbed the paper off the, the copy machine and he thought she had grabbed it. And in process, he just berated her in front of everybody. So it was like, mm, yeah, I think I quit that job after about three weeks. Oh my, it was, I think we all can definitely relate to that. I know the example I was going to share, and it was, oddly enough, it was the exact same company, was, so we have the director who, or like the VP, who I'm definitely looking up to because of his leadership style. However, my direct manager at the time was someone who led based on title. And so there was an assumption that because they had the title, that no matter what they said, you were automatically supposed to do it. They were very insecure with being questioned or someone else on their team that they considered to be, you know, possibly beneath them in some way by title, expressing leadership or showing leadership. So I would say that was probably um, one of the negatives that I experienced in that situation. Well, thank you for that. I don't know. The system booted me back, but I, I appreciate y'all for holding down the fort. <laughs> All right. One of the negatives. Anybody else have a negative that they wanted to share? Yes? No? Okay. Well, let's keep going. All right. So let's talk about it. Let, we're going to get into what professional, uh, what professional means. And, and I want you just to keep these questions in mind. What does it mean to be a professional? What makes someone a professional in your, your field? And what does being unprofessional mean? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we're going forward. But when we think about professionalism, we are talking about being, uh, being reliable, setting your own high standards, showing that you care about your job because people are watching and, and they're moving like you move, right? So it's important that we, that we really um, take heed to that. Um, it's about being industrious and organized and holding yourself accountable for your thoughts, your words, and your actions. And sometimes that means coming back to say, you know what, I was wrong, or you know what, I apologize, or you know what, I thought this was a great idea, but, you know, it didn't work out as we thought, you know, and that level of transparency and being able to take ownership is, is definitely key. Um, the competence or skill required of that profession. You know, do you work hard to um, hone your craft, hone your skills? Are you constantly looking at what other professional development opportunities there are available out there, what the latest um, news is, what are the new innovations and the technology in your area, um, or are you just kind of relying on the things that you always did and the things that you knew when you first got started? Because we know that 
these professions are forever evolving and you have to kind of keep yourself up to date in order to be a professional. So when we're talking about professional image, we're talking about uh, um, the way that a, per a professional image describes the way a person conducts themselves at work and in other professional settings. So where we were talking about executive presence being the, the confidence that you inspire in people, your professional image really talks about the way that you conduct yourself at work and in other professional uh, settings. And it also involves the attitude that you use at work and how others perceive you as well, okay? Um, and and how, how they perceive your attitudes. So people often strive for a professional image that aligns with the expectations of their particular workplace or industry, um, as it can help individuals influence decisions and form important business connections. It can also help communicate with others more effectively. So, you know, all of that being said, one thing is about the, the I mean, and, the, and these things are definitely intertwined, right? So one is about the confidence that you inspire in people, but how do you inspire that confidence? You inspire, you inspire the confidence in the way that you conduct yourself. And I know that this definition, it says, you know, the way that you conduct yourself in at work and other per, professional settings, but I would go so far as to say that um, that it goes beyond that, right? It's about wherever you show up. I was once told that you are always interviewing for your next position, right? And so no matter where you are and who you interact with, you never know when that next person can become a part of your network or the impression that you will leave on them that will make them think about an opportunity that could arise, you know, for you. Again, those, those conversations about you happen behind your back, right? And just like Rod was, was uh, giving us the example of the gentleman that was a $3 million maker, but came in the room just as humble as could be, and no one would have ever guessed, you know, um, that about him and that he fit right in. Right. It was about how he was conducting himself out and about. Right. All right. <clears throat> All right. So here are a few components that make up professional image. Number one, we talked about how important communication is, but part of what makes up that Im image is your communication style, your behavior and attitude right? Your nonverbal communication and your attire and your grooming, right? And grooming is very important. Like Rob said, don't come out in public with those dust bunnies in your hair, looking like you just rolled out of bed. It matters. And people think that I'm just running to the grocery store, or I'm just running to the corner store, or I'm just running to the gas station. You you are meeting people and representing yourself and your business and your brand outside anywhere that you go. So you want to be prepared because you never know when an opportunity will creep up on you in that very in that very moment. So here are a few tips um, that I found that um, could be helpful in creating your professional image. And some of the things, again, are overlaps of uh, some of the conversation we've already had. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on it. But, you know, again, we want to be mindful of first impressions, right? And, and we want to be mindful of those impressions in all, all of these spaces, in industry conventions. Um, you got to consider which behaviors and traits are common for a professional image in certain industry and how you prefer to implement them in your own way, make them your own. You know, your workplace image, you wanna think about how other people currently perceive your position at work and whether their impressions really align with your intentions. And then also your target audience. And that refers to the different interactions that you have at a workplace, including conversations with colleagues, um, employers and or uh, clients. You know, next, you, you want to look at um, how you assess your communication style, because to show your professionalism when you interact with others, you you have certain 
verbal and nonverbal techniques. And people are watching the whole, the whole you. When you show up in a communication, they want to see if the words that are coming out of your mouth match the expressions on your face, or if they match, you know, um, the emotion that you're speaking with, right? If you're talking about something that is, you know, sort of morbid or very serious, are you smiling? You know, do those things align? Am I getting the same feeling um, from you in your nonverbals that I am from what you're saying? Do you come across as, uh, as authentic, right? Or do you come across as phony? And, and, and again, all of that matters. Um, consider what your clothes reflect about you. So again, while it's important to dress within your means, you want to consider whether your everyday attire meets both written and unwritten rules about clothing in the place that you work. And if you are the leader of that company, if it's your own small business, are you, do you have a set of standards for the folks that work for you? And are you showing up with those same standards? Or is it a do as, as I say and not as I do type of situation? Because if that's the case, you don't inspire confidence, right? Folks are looking to you to set the example, right? And so, and we know that there are, sometimes you, you may be in a place or you may have an employee handbook um, where there are specific outlined um, guidelines for how you're supposed to dress or you may be somewhere where there's a uniform. Even in the case of a uniform, get up and press that thing. You know, don't go and, and you can see all the, the creases in it from where you unfolded the pants or unfolded the shirt because you didn't bother to take a, 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 an iron to it, right? And there are people nowadays that hate ironing, but they show up like they hate ironing and they're wrinkled and it gives you a different feel and it doesn't inspire confidence, right? So you just want to be mindful of that. And that you're wearing things that are the right size, that you're wearing the right colors because too, too big, something too big says something, something too small says something else, right? If it's sloppy, if it's unkempt, if it looks dirty, if it has spots on it, you know, you want to just be mindful of those things because it, it matters, okay? Four, use social media thoughtfully because we know that social media's um, increased presence it's important to be mindful of all the versions of yourself that you present online because those things live on in infamy, right? And, you know, how often have we heard people or seen people, particularly in politics, where things that they did in their college years come back to bite them, you know, um, and it may have just been a prank or it may have just been something distasteful that people do at that age, but we have to be mindful of what our image and how we show up online, right? Even if your personal accounts aren't publicly viewable, it's still good practice to assume that anybody can see them. I know for me, when I came on to SCORE and I had to go through an interview process to even be a part of this organization and be in front of you, um, one thing that the person that interviewed me said is that they had been to my LinkedIn account. My Facebook account is is private, but you can still see um, whatever um, uh, like kind of cover photos I put in, in place. And I was thinking, huh, I wonder how many people Google me <laughs> before, you know, they, they meet with me or interview with me. And that's a real thing, right? So you want to be mindful of that and think about how your posts reflect your image um, and and the work that you're kind of trying to cultivate, how, how those things, even that you share, it may be somebody else's post, but you shared it. What does it say about you and what your values are, okay? You also wanna increase your time management skills, right? It's very important that you remain punctual when attending meetings, your pre Oh, did I lose you guys again? Heck. Oh, there you go. All right, Dahlia, you were frozen. I was frozen, I think, but now you're moving, so I know I'm back. 
I'm back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, you want to increase your time management skills. And like I say, you want to show up. If you're on time, you're late. You know, when people show up at work, if your start time is eight o'clock, it doesn't mean that you're just coming in the parking lot at eight o'clock and then getting to your desk. It doesn't mean that you go to your desk at eight o'clock and then you set down your things and then you go get your coffee and you get your water and you go in the bathroom and put your makeup on and then you chat with your neighbors. No, it means that at eight o'clock, I am where I'm supposed to be in my work area and I am getting started with the business at hand, right? If I wanna do all those other things, I need to show up early enough to do all of those things and still be where I'm supposed to be at eight o'clock, right? Because that's what that means. And all too often we get that wrong, right? We're running in the door at our start time, okay? The other thing is find a mentor, find a colleague or a supervisor who can help you learn how to navigate and maintain professional relationships, right? It is an important component of your professional image. And consider selecting a few candidates and having an informal conversation to determine who might be the optimal mentor for your personality. And it's okay to have more than one mentor to mentor you in different areas. And you can oftentimes start by, by figuring out something that you admire about that person or a skill that they have that you really need some help on and you just want them to take you under their wing. It, there's nothing wrong with asking those questions and going to those folks and saying, you know, I really respect what you do and, you know, I could use a good mentor. Do you have time to mentor me? You know, do you have the bandwidth? Because I, I could really use the guidance right? You, you want to remain positive, <clears throat> you know, considering approaching new situations in the workplace optimistically. It may be beneficial to express a warm and confident professional image in certain situations. A new client or a colleague may appreciate a kind action as this is the kind of positivity that can help someone feel comfortable with you and, and can help to start to to build that confidence, they get enthusiastic about working with you when you do that. And then strengthen your emotional intelligence. Oh, excuse me, I, I, I skipped one. Be accountable, right? Just basically own your stuff, own your mistakes, but also own your wins, right? Assume responsibility for the actions to show that you can follow up with others because it, it shows integrity and it also shows a desire to improve your own conduct. It, it, it shows that you, you may not be perfect, but you are still learning and you're still right there with everyone else, you know, learning and striving to be your best self. And then again, strengthen your emotional intelligence because emotional intelligence involves the ability to perceive the mood of others and then alter your behavior ac accordingly. You know, um, we are in the habit of saying, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Or, hey, I'm blessed and highly favored. Or, hey, everything is wonderful. You know, but if somebody really said, you know what? <clears throat> I am not good. Do you hear them? Or do you say, oh, that's great. And you keep on walking. Have a great day, right? I'm not okay. And sometimes people will tell you that. Today, I was having one of those days. And for folks that called me, I said, you know what? I'm not okay. Today is a day I am not okay. And everybody, thankfully, that I contact, I was in contact with today, you know, gave me time and space to be able to express what I was dealing with and what I was going through. And were, they were able to lend support so that I could show up here for, for you today with all this energy and excitement about this subject matter right? Because somebody listened and somebody took the time um, to say, okay, well, I'm here for you. I listened to you and, and, and all will be well, right? And then lastly, attend networking events. You want to be out there and getting your space in the place, you know, developing relationships. And when you're networking, and there's some people that absolutely hate networking. They are, they're like, I'm shy or I'm really introverted. I'm not shy, but I'm introverted. And I'm being in a room full of people just takes all the energy I have left. But it's important to get your name out there because if nobody knows who you are, how will they know what you can do? 
How can they um, recommend you for opportunities and how can they bring business um, your way if they don't know you exist? You got to get yourself out there and, and, you know, you can set a small goal for yourself. I, in this room, I'm going to talk to two or three people, right. And, and make an impact or, or have a conversation with, you don't have to take over the whole room, but each time that you have the opportunity to be in spaces, you know, have those conversations, you will be surprised at, you know, who you will meet and what connections you will meet. And when meeting a new peer, learn their name and ask relevant questions about their life and their work. And it's also important to speak confident, confidently about your own work, right? Because that's the action that conveys your expertise and your organization skills and that is what is going to build or help to begin building the foundations for that confidence that you need for people to be able to talk about you behind your back in a good way about those opportunities that come up behind the doors. So I talked a lot and I talked really fast because we have a lot to cover and we got to get to Dahlia's um, um, exercise before too long, but I want to take a moment here to just kind of do a little bit of reflection and also give you an opportunity to ask questions or give feedback uh, on anything that we have talked about to this point. And certainly you may unmute and or place your responses in the chat. Anybody brave enough to, to speak out? Nobody, anybody? Dahlia, did you have anything you wanted to add to the conversation before we move forward? No, I think you're expounding upon it wonderfully. I don't have anything additional at this point, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay, thank you so much. Okay, so this is a good time to just kind of re reflect on yourself, right? And with all the things that we talked about, executive presence and the, the confidence that you instill in people and professional image and how you show up, you know, to really think about yourself and how you show up and how do you feel like people see you? We People oftentimes will tell us exactly how we show up, right? I remember my first gig in management. It did not go well. I did not, you know, I knew my, I knew the business, right? I knew the product and I was great in terms of problem solving and giving folks answers. But I used to come in and it was in a call center environment and my my cubicle was at the very back of the room. And I would make sure that I would go to the back and pass everybody to get to my cubicle. And my people started to tell me, you know, that it felt like I was sneaking in and trying to catch them doing something. Or, you know, there were people who needed that good morning from me. There were people who needed me to walk down the center aisle basically announcing my presence and saying, good morning, how are you? Happy Monday, happy Tuesday, right? Um, and that was not who I was. However, everybody can't be wrong, right? So I had to take the feedback from my team because I needed my team to feel like um, they wanted to be there and that I needed them to want to work for me and with me. You know, um, and so I had to take those things into into account. And over time, I have really worked at becoming a better manager, a better leader, a better supervisor, a better person, a better colleague within those spaces. But it's because I've been willing to do some self-reflection, to hear the things that people are saying about me. I've been told before, now this was a long, long time time ago, of course, people, but, you know, that I was abrasive, you know, that um, I was too direct. I mean, I've been told all of those things before. Now, some of those things are, you know, where people get hung up on cultural things, but some of those things are just real feedback and how you, and how I left people feeling. And so I really, if that's not what my intention was, then I needed to do something uh, about that for me. 
right? And so I want you to really take some time and think about how you show up and what are the things people say about you um, that maybe you should take heed to. Whether you like it or not, agree with it or not, if you have more than one person telling that to you, it's something to be taken into consideration, particularly if it is impacting how you show up to people. So why, again, is professional image important? Because it allows you to have better client interactions, better work relationships, um, enhanced reputation, and increased self-esteem once all these things begin working in your favor. Once your, people are saying positive things about you and those opportunities come your way, you it's important to dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have right? You should always be thinking next level. Now, <clears throat> professional image types, there's that desired professional image, there's that undesired professional image, and there's the perceived professional image. So desired is what we want others to think and know about us. That undesired is what we don't want others to think, but they sometimes do. And then lastly, based on people's direct experience. Now, which of those do you think has the most impact? Do you think it's desired, undesired, or perceived? Drop it in the chat for me. Perceived. Absolutely. Absolutely, Rod. It is how people perceive you because that becomes your reality. So although you know, you have this desired professional image and you may feel like you show up one way. If you're not being perceived that way by others, then you have some work to do. And that is the one that will definitely make or break you because it will determine whether people have confidence in you, whether they want to give you a chance, whether they believe in you, whether they will follow you. So very good, Rod. Thank you. All right. Successful professionals. Again, as we go along. So strengths. Strengths defined, right? So we're going to use this acronym of SIGN. So S is success. Strengths are where you feel successful, right? I is instinct. Strengths are activities that you are naturally drawn to. G is growth. Strengths are where you learn the most, come up with the newest ideas, and have the best insights. And then N being needs, strengths are where you feel you need to spend more time. And what is wrong with operating from a strengths-based perspective? If you all had to think about the one thing that you that is just the gift, right? That is just a gift or a talent that you just do naturally, that, that everyone gives you kudos on. And it may not be the thing that you work on or work in right now, but that one thing can be the thing that you want to spend your time in and manifest. And then the things where you may not be so strong in, guess what? You partner with others that have a different set of skills or a different strength so that you can create not only a diverse team, but one that is operating from a strengths-based perspective and where you where you operate in your strengths and natural gifts is where you build confidence and where you do your best work. And it allows everybody in that group to do the same. And where you have a group of successful people all working and doing the things that come naturally and that they're really good at and that they're happy at, oh my gosh, the productivity in that group can be through the roof. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. And um, let's see, what is this? You know, that's, I don't know, just a little divider slide. So, you know, these are just some questions to help you identify your strengths. What do you value most about yourself or your profession? What are some of those things down? And it would be a good idea to jot some of those things down, right? Because when we document it, it makes it real. When those things are just floating around in our head, it's easy to lose track and lose sight of them, right? So what do you value most? What are attributes that make um, you really good? What are some of the things that are innate in you that make you excellent? And it's okay to show up and say, you know what? I am a bad woman because, 
And whatever the rest of that statement is, it's okay. I used to do that as an exercise when uh, I'm, I, I'm an adjunct instructor. So I teach business and human resources classes. And sometimes that first day of class, I made every student stand up and tell me something positive about themselves. They had to finish that, that sentence. I am a bad woman, man, person, you know, because, and they had to finish that. And so many people had trouble coming up with a way to finish that sentence in a positive way. But if I ask them to tell me 10 negative things, they could rattle those off right off the top. So think about the things that are your best attributes and make, make you really good and write them down because some days you need to remind yourself of why you are a bad person, right? And when do you receive the most positive feedback at work? What is it that you're doing? You know, what is that talent? What is that thing that gets everybody on board and say, oh my gosh, we couldn't do without you, right? That's a strength and you should use that to your advantage. And you have to know your, your strengths. And when we do know our strengths, according to Gallup, employees are more confident, self-aware and productive. They, uh, you have higher employees engagement, increased performance, and lower attrition rates. You also have clients and patients that feel more helpful. And one thing as a leader that it is important for you to also do is help your employees identify the strengths in themselves. It's not enough for you to walk around and saying, oh yeah, I'm good at this and this is my strength and I am a, this, I have a superpower and this is what it is, right? But you wanna help everybody identify their superpower. So again, you can build those strength-based teams that I was talking about before, right? You wanna make sure that you give people that space and you, you have activities or and opportunities for them to be able to show up in their best selves and, and bring their strengths forward right? And these are the things that happen when you don't know your strengths, right? You're less engaged, six times less engaged in a job. You may dread going to work. You're less inspired. You know, you have more negative interactions because of how you're showing up. You're speaking and feeling badly at work. You, you achieve less on a daily basis. You have fewer positive and creative moments. You have more difficulty responding to challenges and there's a lot more self-doubt. So you really got to focus on those strengths. And if you don't know what they are, you got to figure those out, you know, and use others to help you do that. If you're just not sure, ask people, the ones that are closest to you and that are around you, what do you think I'm really good at? Okay. So... <clears throat> This, we're going to take a little stretch break and then we're going to move into Dahlia's exercise and it's what's your leadership direction and she's going to give us a leadership compass exercise everyone at this point needs to get some paper a pencil but I really want you to take a few minutes to stretch because we've been sitting here for a good amount of time um and then we're going to get started. So when you have, you know, a, something to write with, please drop in the chat, in the chat. I'm ready. When you have something to write with, please drop in the chat. I'm ready. All right. We got one ready. Okay. We got two ready. We don't want to leave you behind, so make sure you're dropping in the chat. I'm ready. All right. All right. Okay. We rolling now. Yes, we are. All perfect. Right. Perfect. I'm so, turning it over to thanks. you, Dalton. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Karen. So, as she said, we are now going to talk about, you're fine, we're now going to talk about your leadership compass. And so, for those that were on the call last week, we kind of did like a, a little exercise to see like, how do you lead? Like what type of, like, how are you coming to the table? Well, this is another tool. And it's really, I, I, I love this tool because I find that it's extremely simplified. And it's a really great tool, not only for yourself, but something that you can use to um, give to your team. 
Um, the language is super simple. It doesn't take, it's, it, it's not a lot of what I would call like technical jargon. Um, and so I, I, I'm a lover of quotes. And so it says, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So this is going to give you a really good quick snapshot of what your natural lean is when it comes to being a leader. Like what direction are you normally operating in? Um, so we can go to the next slide. So there's a few things um, that, that you're gonna need. Hopefully everyone has your writing utensils, some paper. This will maybe take five minutes. Um, what's gonna happen is that each slide, there's going to be a total of four slides, will have 10 statements, okay? And so you're going to go through those statements and basically, and basically evaluate yourself. That's a better word. Um, next slide. So what is this going to accomplish? So the goal is to really give us, as I said, a very simple vocabulary and a way of thinking about how we work with others, okay? It helps you recognize different work styles um, and then it will allow you to reflect on your own work style and then also learn possible areas of growth. Now, the one thing I just want to make sure that you're aware of is that a lot of times we categorize ourselves into the work style that we think fits us best, okay? But this is going to show you what you actually kind of do. Um, no one is purely one style. Now, I, there's a caveat to that because when I first took this, which was back in 2008, um, I was one direction point. And so that is not the goal, um, but it is okay if you are. It lets you know kind of where you're starting from. Um, and so, and what I also, what I really love is that all comments can be directed towards a work style and not a person. So you'll see what, I'm, what I mean as we get further into it. So we can go to the next slide. So here's just a, a quick overview of instructions, essentially. So we're gonna, um, Karen kind of gave you a little cheat sheet. So once we slide over to the, to the very next slide, as I said, there's going to be 10 statements on each slide, right? So you're going to read the statement on the slide. You'll get about a minute, minute and a half. You'll, you will essentially tally um, which statement applies to you and how you make choices and decisions at work. And so each of these statements will apply to all of us or some of the time, but the goal is to really determine which statement represents you the most. And so at the end, you're gonna then count the total uh, number of tally marks on each section and then place that number next to the direction that is indicated, which will be on the top of the page. Um, and so the section or direction with the highest number of tally marks will be your dominant decision-making style. And one thing I want to really encourage you is don't overthink it at all. Like whichever one feels like it's your gut to go to, that just go ahead and score because what you want to do is be honest, open, and transparent with yourself. Be honest with yourself. There are no right or wrong answers. This is just really, like I said, a really simple way for you to get a snapshot of what your leadership style is. And as I said, I think it's really good also for teams for you can kind of see how the rest of you work. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. So this first slide is north and I will be quiet for a moment while you guys go through um, each of these, which is more than 10 or is it 10? No, I can't count. It is 10. Sorry. Long day. <laughs> um, go ahead. Read those and assign which ones um, resonate with you the most. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can you please uh, uh, put your bar on the top because the first line is being overlapped. Uh, it says like participants. The bar, the sharing. Like it, it's blocking. I understand how people need to. The share screen bar, uh, like if you happen to move it on the top, that maybe then we can see the. Okay. The How's top that? It's blocking. It's still blocking. You can see your screen as well. 
I moved so is it just the, the first statement? I'm sorry, yeah, is it just the first statement? Yeah. I am usually assertive, active, and decisive is the very first statement. Because I guess, Karen, I can see it fully on my side. So yeah, I guess. I can't no, too, it's so good. Sure. It's good now. Okay, very good. Because I moved okay. the car all the way out of the way, I thought. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Thank you for letting me know that awesome. I need to. Karen, while they're doing this, I, I said last week that we need, like, score needs, like, some theme music. So, like, during these times, we can, like, play, like, score theme music in the background. Agreed. Anita, can you work <laughs> on that? <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> I don't know if we have any budding composers in the group, but <laughs> might be able to come up with something. Or maybe we and can to just a theme from Jaws. <laughs> oh, gosh. So as you guys round out, you know, just kind of following suit, if you could just throw, you know, that you're finished or ready. Um, for us to go to the next slide. That way we don't leave anyone behind. So again, once you're finished, just type finished or next in the chat. Okay, they're starting to come in. All right. <clears throat> Is it okay to move ahead, everybody? I see it. I see most folks have. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. If there's anybody who still needs some more time, take yourself off mute and let me know real fast. Nope. Okay. It's moving on to South. And same deal, as you finish up and tally, go ahead and let us know that you're done. Okay, I see Arian and Andrea. All right. Okay, they're starting to come in. Okay, give it a few more seconds. All right, fantastic. Brandy! Yay! Nidra, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to move to the next. If anybody still needs time, unmute and tell me because I see a lot of duns in the chat. All right, we're moving. All right, rinse and repeat. Go ahead and get started and then drop done in the chat when you're ready. Get out of there. Sorry, I was yelling at my dog.
Okay, it looks like everybody's done. We're gonna move on to the very last and this the West. Okay, there we go. Okay, I see most people are done. Is there anyone that needs a little bit more time? Nope, okay. It's results time. <laughs> so before we actually dive into um, the work styles themselves and what they mean, is anyone brave enough to put their top two direction points in the chat? I'm really, I'm really curious, curious to see. Go back one, Karen, because I wanted to hide that until. Okay. Uh oh. Here we go. Sorry. Okay, we got south, east, south. Okay, southeast, southwest. We we'll had on north to the house. Let's see. Oh, we have a lot of Souths. I tied with three Southeast and West, okay. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, you guys, for being willing to share. Like I said, we got a lot of Souths in the house, Souths and East and West. Um, so perfect. So now let's kind of dive into what these direction points mean. So we can go to the next slide. So on this particular slide, we're going to um, dive a little bit into north as well as south. These two are together because they are obviously on the compass point, polar opposites of one another. Um, for our, we didn't, no one put that they were, uh, that they, uh, resonated more with North, but a North is a person that, you know, is very assertive, very decisive, you know, the, the person that you probably met or worked with that has the vision and just let's go, let's do it. Like they don't want to slow down. They're not worried about the details. They just know that this is what they want to get done and however it needs to get done is how it just needs to get done. Um, quick to act, as I said, expresses a sense of urgency for others to act. Um, they really think in terms of the bottom line. They like things. To, they like to keep things moving, and that and, and that a lot of times when it comes to leadership is one of their greatest strengths, is that they keep the ball moving in the direction towards the goal. Um, they're comfortable being in front of a room or a crowd. So a lot of people that are probably considered natural leaders a lot of times can fall into um, the North category. Um, and, you know, last statement, value oriented phrases like do it now or I'll do it. Or, you know, again, what is the bottom line? You know, are you been in, the, in the, the meeting with the person? It's like, why are we here? What are we talking about? How can we keep this moving? Because I have something to do. Um, that, that is your North. Um, and so for my, my Souths, which again, you guys are dominating tonight. Um, the Souths are very 
empathetic. You're, you're very focused on people, which is the wonderful thing about the South. As I said, these two um, work in tandem with one another because the South actually helps balance the North, where the North is ready to run down the street and get things done. They're not necessarily worried about the people in the group. The South is the one to say, hey, slow down. We need to make sure that we get everyone's input. We need to make sure that everyone is included in this. Um, whereas the North also makes sure that the South keeps things moving and doesn't get so caught up in their love for people and opinions when a decision has to be made. That's where the North kind of steps in. But again, to dive a little bit into South, as I said, they understand how people need to receive information in order to act upon it. So again, very concerned about making sure that everyone is on the same page, very value driven regarding aspects of professional life. Excuse me, it's very supportive of colleagues and peers, um, feeling based, trust their own emotions and intuition as truth. Um, and value oriented words are what's right and what is fair. So again, these two really work in tandem with one another. One keeps the ball rolling, but the other one makes sure that you, you, you respect who's actually riding the bike and moving the train along the way. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So now we have our West and our East and similar to North and South, they, they work together. So if we just start with West, our West is very analytical. They like the data, um, understand what information is needed to assist in the decision-making. Um, moves very carefully and you know, follows procedures and guidelines. Like they like to make sure all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. Um, they weigh in on, on an issue. They like for things to be balanced. They're self-analytical and introspective, very careful. Um, their value-oriented word is objective. So if we add our West into our North and our South, so again, you have the North that's driving down the street. You have the South that's making sure that the people that are actually driving the bus are not being forgotten. But you have the West that's coming in to say, how is this going to actually get done? You know, what are the details? What, what is the actual plan to make sure that things are implemented um, correctly and that we don't hit any bumps down the road? And so, and now we hop into East. So East is our visionary. Uh, these are the people, as the first line says, they see the big picture. They're the ones that are coming to the table with the big goal and the big dream. And, you know, I want to build a, a Disney world, you know, type, you know, type dreams. Um, very idea oriented and they focus on future thought. They focus on the future a lot. Um, they uh, are very adept at problem solving. They appreciate a lot of information. So they work very good with West because West loves information and their value oriented words are option, possibility and imagine. So again, if we put all four of these together, the East has come in and said, this is something I would like to build. The North is like, absolutely, let's get it done. The West comes in and says, okay, how can we get it done? And the South says, don't forget the people that are doing it and appreciate them because that's the best way to get it done. So all of these styles work in tandem with, with each other. And as I said, the goal is for us, is for you to actually find a balance with all four. Now, when I started earlier and I said, when I first started and when I first took this back in 2008, I was one direction point, I was a North. I fully wanted just let's just get it done. I don't, I don't, let's not worry about the emotion. Let's not worry about XYZ. And working in an organization where we were, I don't want to say forced, but essentially when we were forced to recognize there are different work styles and there's a value in each of them is what taught me to appreciate all of the rest of these styles and taught me how to work with them. And so, uh, which eventually then affected my, who I was as a person. So every time I take this, my compass is a little bit different just based on the things that I have encountered thus far in life and what I've learned. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So on the opposite end, then go back up one or two. One more, there we go. So on the opposite end, there's, you know, 
there's a little bit of a dark side to all of these direction points. So again, for North, you know, because we really want to get down the street and get things done, that means, you know, we can easily overlook process and strategic planning. You know, we can sometimes get a little bit defensive, um, you know, and want to try to out expert you because we just want to get it done. Um, sometimes sees things in terms of black and white, you know, very little tolerance for ambiguity. Um, can sometimes go beyond limits, can be impulsive and disregard practical issues and value oriented phrases. If you want something done, do it yourself. And I think we all have met someone that, ha that has stated that phrase at some point. Um, for the South, again, empathy can sometimes lose focus on goals when they believe relationships or needs of people are being compromised. So again, very focused on the team, very focused on what does this person need in order to move forward. Um, sometimes has trouble saying no to request, has difficulty consulting, confronting, and dealing with anger, maybe manipulated by anger. So not a confrontational uh, type personality. Um, can sometimes overcompromise to avoid conflict. So Earl, so up top of it says, has trouble saying no. You know, can sometimes be used, we're going to continue to put stuff on your plate. And because you want to be a team player, because you don't want to say no, you know, you are manipulated in those ways. And so um, may become mired in the process at the expense of accomplishing goals. So again, can sometimes get caught up in the weeds of what does everyone need? Um, and not necessarily how do we move the needle forward. And you can go to the next slide. And same thing for um, West or East. So for West, again, analytical. So it can get bogged down by information or analysis paralysis, uh, you know, as a, a common phrase that we've heard. Um, can be indecisive, you know, sometimes collect unnecessary or too much data you know, because they're bogged down in the details. Um, can have a tendency towards watchfulness or observation, really wanting to make sure that things are done correctly. So sometimes the West can be a micromanager, the person that does not know how to let go of the process. Um, and they resist emotional pleas and change because again, the focus is on the details. So the details in this situation or this type of personality uh, or leadership style is what's most important. And for East, again, the visionary. So can put too much emphasis on vision at the expense of action. Um, can be so focused on the big picture that they don't necessarily want to sit down out of fear that it will take them away from the, the dream that they have in front of them or don't want to get bogged down by the details. You know, not time bound, they lose track of time. Again, very focused on, you know, looking at the dream and not looking at what actually needs to be done to make it to, for it to be accomplished. You know, will not work on projects that do not have comprehensive vision. So if they're unable to see the vision up front, they may not understand why they're doing something at all. And easily frustrated and overwhelmed when outcomes are not in line with vision. So the vision is the vision, and that's kind of where that leadership style lives. And if the and if as you move forward, it, what is happening does not necessarily necessarily align with the initial vision, um, they, that can sometimes be a challenge for that particular leadership style. And so next slide. Sorry, perfect. Thanks. So how are you going to use what you know? So. What's interesting is on this next slide, it says knowing limitations is a strength. And really it's knowing yourself is a strength um, because we talk about the, the, the strengths as well as the limitations. So, but it is good to know where and when you get stressed. Is it deadlines, busy schedule, technology? Like who challenges you? You know, for instance, as I said, when I first took that, um, leadership compass, I was basically 99% North. So working with someone who was a South, who was very focused on people and emotions was extremely challenging to me. Um, and I had to figure out how do I find 
the benefits of working with this individual? What are the benefits and what can I learn from them um, as well? You know, how do you impact others? Again, knowing how you naturally come to the table gives you a, a different perspective when you're receiving responses from others. You know, if you're coming to the table very people focused, you know, is the responses from others not people focused? You know, do they feel maybe things are being, you know, your, your image of things may not align with their image of things? And why is that? But where, what perspective are they coming from? Um, your thinking process, again, how are you thinking about things? Are you a, a West and you like details and data, but are you, do you happen to be talking to an East who wants to just talk about the big picture? So how do those two thought processes come together in order to um, benefit the overall project? So I want to pause right there really quickly before we go into the next, before I hand it back over um, to Karen. And I just wanted to say, when I started off talking, I, I mentioned that I think that this type of this leadership compass, I've always been a fan of because I believe that it is, like I said, it's very simple language and it allows you to talk to your entire team in direction points, um, not as who they are. It's much easier to say, OK, who on this team um, is a South, you know, versus well, who on this team is only really going to focus on people um, or who on this team is a North. And I know that I can you know, lean on them to drive a project who, if I need to get some data um, done or I, I need to figure out how to get this done, who do I know that's going to organically kind of get in the weeds and get it done? Um, it's a really good way of looking at and finding out the strengths um, that are on your team and the strengths that you bring to the table to figure out how you all can work together. So I didn't know if anyone wanted to come off mute, if you, anyone had any feedback about that. Um, but if not, I will hand it over to Karen, but I will be quiet at this point and see. Thank you, Dahlia. Yeah, I'd like, I'd be interested in hearing any feedback that you had. Um, drop some, just drop a little nugget that you learned about yourself or how will you use what you know now? Anybody? Anybody? So you all knew all of this about yourself before you ever took this. Oh, I need a North collaborator. I love that, right? So exactly. Look look at that. that. That is, and let me just say that that is key to what we were talking about and what I was talking about before, right? Building a team where you can bring folks in Right. Once you know who you're working with, then you can bring folks in to build that strength based team. Right. So now you figured out some things about how you work. Now you see where you may need to fill in some of those gaps and what kind of people you need to diversify and strengthen that team. Fantastic. Anybody else? Um, I would say that I wasn't surprised by um, the outcome of my leadership campus. Um, I, I am more of a South person. Okay. Um, and I kind of tie with the East and West, which I don't know if that's typical because it sounds like most people usually are two, but it seems like I have three, but I wasn't surprised by, you know, neither one of them. Yeah. Um, but I'm also a person who needs a, a North person. Like, Mm -hmm. who's going to get the job done so mm -hmm. well thank you for sharing that Nidra and yet that's that just means you're unique and here's the thing the, the one thing that you have to keep in mind with this assessment and any other right is that this just really shows you what you lean towards but situ situationally and 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 given a different opportunity you may operate in and out of some of those various directions, right? So, you know, and it may also depend on who's at the table. Somebody may come to the table that is, you know, a, a strong this or a strong that. And it may be that you may start operating in one of those others that you scored pretty highly in because that's what you feel. And organically, that's what is needed in that conversation at that time. Does that make sense? Yes. 
Okay, very good. Anybody else brave enough to share? I um yes. I found that like I have a I'm very strong in the east, but I okay. also have quite a bit in the south. And um I'm also that person that's comfortable. I can walk in a room with 10,000 people. It makes me no difference and we can do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like I wasn't surprised, especially to see the that visionary part because oftentimes my head is in the cloud and it's been there probably for most of my life. I've always been that dreamer uh, looking at the big picture. And sometimes I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily sit down and get into the details. I kind of like, okay, I got this idea. Now let me put the group together that will create the idea. Um, but I've also found that it kind of depends. Well, my people, I kind of, it depends on who I'm working with because I try to get to know them, know what their being is. No, uh, I need to learn that individual so I can learn how to encourage them and, and, and build them up so that I can get the most out of them that's possible so we can be as productive as possible. Uh, one of the things I've found in, in, in what I do is and I often tell um, my partner this is that we're not only dealing with clients, but we also got to build our staff because on any given day, they can come in and be all over the place. And so we got to center everybody, which also means we got to center ourselves. So th this is really wild, but I, I saw some of, uh, and each one of those, there's some things I do, but I primarily, I'm in the East. You're on mute, Karen. <laughs> Say that again. She was she was sharing she was sharing something real good with you. She was on mute. Yeah, I was on mute. Oh, you couldn't hear me, Ron. <laughs> oh my goodness, I had to get myself together. Thank you. But yeah, that's fantastic, and you can see how it you ebb and flow, and you can see parts of yourself and how you operate in those things. And you know, can any of you see perhaps going back to just even even if you are a leader in a in somebody else's company, right? administering this to others that are around you, it really illuminates some things and it helps you learn something about somebody else and how they think. And so therefore, you know how to deal with them a little bit better or a little differently because now you know something else about them that you wouldn't know just by looking at them. And that's how they're processing information. That's how they're seeing things. It's how they come across as a leader. Can any of you see yourselves using that at work or within your own businesses? You could just drop a yes or a no in the chat. I definitely can see it. Um... Because I, I think I, I try to move away from a lot of right and wrong. I think oftentimes, I know some of the people I work with, it's either right or wrong. And I try to move away from it and say, no, let's understand who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's once we begin to understand and accept ourselves, we can get a little more comfortable with accepting other people and what they do and how they do. It's not that it's wrong, it's that's just how you do what you do. And as much as possible, I try to give people that space that here's what we need. And when they begin to say, well, how would you do it? I don't mind showing you, but here's the thing. I want your creativity. I want you to be able to feel free to express yourself. And then we'll see if we need to tweak it. But You I are a wise man, Rod. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's how I try to do it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Very wise. You always drop these nuggets every week. Every week you have been coming in strong and I appreciate that. Yeah. And that is important, you know, and as part of being a leader too, though, is recognizing that we all need to be constantly working towards that. Right. And that we all need to be working at strengthening ourselves um, and what we do. And so, um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to take us through a couple of these slides and some of them we may skip over because we have about 15 minutes left and I definitely want to be a respecter of time. But this is just asking you to really think about how you show up. How do you show up? And you have to be honest with yourself. Again, this isn't going to be a quiz and I'm not going to ask you to drop it in the chat, right? But when you show up, are you ready? Are you welcoming and, and curious and interested and patient and trustworthy? Or... Do you show up unprepared, winging it, 
you kind of defensive, you're self-absorbed, in a rush, preoccupied. You know, now there are days that any of us at any time can show up in either in either one of those kind of mindsets. But what do you primarily do? Are you usually ready? Are you are you ready to go? You welcome them to everybody? Are you the pep squad leader, you know? Um, or do you just kind of make people feel like, ah, you don't want to be bothered and you're in a position of leadership. So many leaders do that. And, and I'm hoping that you're here. And if you are one of those leaders that you'll admit that to yourself and that you'll change your ways. So now we want to look at what professional behaviors look like and in terms of language, appearance, and actions. And again, you know, we won't go through each and every one of these, but you know, you know, it's the difference between how can I help you and, and introducing yourself and kind of knowing and respecting people's names. If you don't know how to, to how to pronounce it, asking them how to pronounce it and really working on getting that right, that matters to people, right? And then there's some others here, you know, apologize um, for confusion or a delay when when you're wrong and those kinds of things. Your appearance, are you making eye contact with folks? Um, are you dressed appropriately and groomed appropriately for the job? Are you clean, organized? Are you smiling, right? Um, when, you, when you talk about actions, are you assisting and giving directions or, or are you answering or asking questions, um, showing up on time? Uh, again, and we've been through all of these, you know, are you responding in a timely manner? Those are things that are real marks of professional behavior. On the other thing, on the other hand, though, you have unprofessional behaviors. And if you're doing any of these things, it makes a difference in how you show up day to day and it affects your executive presence and your professional, your professional image. You know, are you saying, what do you want? Are you just giving closed ended responses like yes or no? Are you using slang? Are you overusing the jargon um, with that, that is noted in your profession, right? Um, are you a person prone to saying it's not my job or not taking ownership? Do you use inappropriate humor at work? Are you monotone or scripted? Those are just some ways in language that you can show up in an unprofessional way. Are you too casual, too formal? Are you sloppy? No smile ever, no eye contact. You know, um, when when folks are are trying to reach out to you, are you ghosting them or are your responses like delayed for an you know inappropriate amount of time? Are you blaming others? Are you arguing with others? You know, are you hard to reach? Is your voicemail always full? <clears throat> are your responses inconsistent? Are you gossipy with the rest of the people? You know, um, are you looking at your watch or your phone while other folks are in conversation? Or do you just ignore people altogether? Those are all signs of unprofessional behavior. And certainly if we do these things, they're not cute. So we really need to work on how we are showing up for ourselves and for others. Maya Angelou, this is a great Maya Angelou uh, quote. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's just so, so important to keep in mind for you just every day, you know, as a human being, but really particularly as a leader within any organization or a leader within your own right, or even if you're a leader without a title, it matters and people remember how you make them feel. That's the case, right? So you just want to keep those things in mind. And so as we wrap up tonight, I'm going to ask that you take just a second. We're going to give you just a few minutes to, since you have that paper and pen um, handy, um, let's talk about, just jot down a few things that you want to take away from tonight. You know, give yourself one action item 
that you're going to work on or you're going to do or one thing that you took away that you're going to implement tomorrow. Give yourself, you know, write down some of the takeaways and give yourself an action item. And we're going to give you just a few minutes to do that. I'm going to mute myself so that you have some time to do that. And when you're ready to move on, go ahead and indicate that in the chat. And also, if you'd like to share one of the things that you're going to work on in the chat, we welcome that too. And I noticed Angela had a hand up. Angela, do you still have a question or was that from a, a while ago? I'm sorry, I just saw it. You can unmute yourself and speak or drop it in the chat. I think Angela is not able to unmute herself. Um, Anita, can you bring, make it so that Angela Williams can uh, unmute herself? Perfect. Angela, did you have a question? You can unmute yourself now if you do. Okay. Okay, and as you start finishing up your notes, just drop us uh, done in the chat so we, we know we can go forward. If you've written down your takeaway and your action item, that would be awesome. Okay. I'm starting to see some duns come through. Okay. Okay. And as we prepare to wrap up, would anyone like to share, you know, a takeaway, uh, something that really resonated with them or your action item? Anything you want to share, just one thing will be sufficient. Anybody. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead, Rod. As I'm starting to uh, build my team for the treatment center that we're opening up, mm -hmm. I want to I want to begin to look at these different styles and people mm -hmm. because I, I really think it's essential that we have all of them mm -hmm. and and how we can best work together because uh, we always have that motto: the teamwork make the dream work. That's right. And so that is, you know, I, I strive to, to get us also to be able to to understand each other better. And if we can understand who I'm working with, it makes it easier so we can have that patience because we do have that uh, sometimes that personality of like, let's just go. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you look back and like, OK, by the way, you was traveling like 90 miles an hour and then you bust a left turn. You have lost three, four people. <laughs> right. That's right. That's, that's right. That's right. It, it, that exactly that does happen. You are so right. Yeah. So that that's that's my takeaway for them. One of my takeaways is quite a bit. I usually just kind of sit back and, and think on these things after we're done. Very good. By the way, you ladies have done a fantastic job. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Rod. We appreciate you. We appreciate you showing up because we respect and value the time that you give up right? To come and be here with us. So thank you so much. And I see Nidra said she's she's going to work on respecting people's differences. 
Amen. That's awesome. Because being able to do that, I mean, because that's very powerful. If you really think about that, that right? That is okay. You need differences. You need diversity because that diversity of thought is how some of the best ideas are generated. You need to be able to have some lively discussion, some scholarly discussion, some, some you know, diverse ideas at the table. So I love that. Anybody else want to share? Okay, well, we won't prolong it. I'm not going to just call on people because maybe next week when it's the last week, but not tonight when it's almost nine o'clock. I'm not going to do that to you. All right. So next steps. Again, you should have written down at least one thing that's going to be your next step. And it's important that you write these things down because when you write them down, it makes them real and it gives you something to really work towards, right? It's like they say, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. If you don't write these things down, they don't happen. They leave your mind and you don't have those reminders, those visual reminders to go back and remind you of. And once again, next week, join us Tuesday for the final part of our series where we will be talking about who's in the workplace and understanding generations in the workplace. So we are looking forward to closing out this series. We thank you all for your time and, you know, your um, engagement in this process. Dahlia, any final words that you'd like to give? Um, no, well, I said no, and then I started talking. So first I wanted to um, just <laughs> thank Rod for um, what he said. We definitely appreciate it. I also wanted to confirm Everyone gets the slides. Everyone that's an attendant tonight, do they get the slides? Yeah, I'm going to make sure that Anita gets them. Um, Everybody uh, will get a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. So, very good. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure that people would have the leadership compass information right there um, for them to use for their teams. But no, I just thank everyone for being here. And I'm looking forward to the pinnacle next week. <laughs> so, yeah this has been a, it's been a long everyone. series but it is this is for us you know this is um you know kind of our passion project right oh. something that we work so hard on because we we know that these are things that people don't always talk about but yet they are essential to you being mm. your best self and these are things that whether you know it or not can impact profit if you are a small business owner and you don't get some of these things, believe me, you can be standing in the way of your own earning potential. So, you know, we want to share those things. And thank you so much, Arian and Claudia and, and Nidra and Claudia. I hope I said your name right. You could tell me if I didn't, because I want to make sure that I get it right. But yeah, so we, you know, we appreciate your time and your feedback. And with that being said, we will see you next week. Thank you all. And we, you'll get the slides and we'll make sure you get a link also to the Leadership Compass, um, as well as the slides that had the information on them as well. And Anita, I'll get all that to you tomorrow. Okay, very good. Right. Thank very you good. all for Good night, everybody. Good night. See you next week.